Hi, I'm your host, Billy Goodnick, and you're watching Garden Wise, Santa Barbara County's favorite place for learning about sustainable landscaping. You know, our community's done a fabulous job saving water during this unprecedented drought. But can we continue to save water and have beautiful, useful gardens to enhance our homes? California native plants should play an important role in your water conservation strategy. They not only help the environment, but they also fit into almost any style of landscape. In our first segment, we talk with Betsy Collins, Director of Horticulture at the Santa Barbara Botanic Gardens, to dispel some myths about natives and at the same time explore some of their benefits. I'm here at the Pritzloff Conservation Center at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. It's uh, the new jewel in the crown, beautiful facility, and I'm here with Betsy Collins, who's the Director of Horticulture. And we're going to talk about uh, the big myths about using California native plants in your garden. Welcome. Hey, Billy. How are you doing? Good. How are you today? Fabulous. Uh, first thing comes to mind for me, and I hear this from, from clients and people I teach, is that if it's from California, it'll grow in any garden in California. Is that uh, truth or, or fiction? Well, it's a little bit of both, actually. Okay. Um, so here at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, we try and grow plants from all over California. That's our mission. And um, we've been testing them out for 90 plus years. Um, we have found ones that grow uh, well in our local environment and um, and some we've not been so successful with but uh, I wouldn't say that you can guess exactly which plants from which region will grow well in your gardens. Our goal uh, for our um, ourselves and our, our public is to have beautiful functional gardens filled with native plants. So if any California plant isn't necessarily the best candidate how do they get to that point where they can put their, fit, their foot in the water and, and uh, get rolling with some natives? Well, I think the best thing to do is to approach the Botanic Garden. We, um, we are the local experts and I actually can share with your viewers this wonderful little booklet that we um, published about a year ago where what we took was our 90 years of uh, experience with growing natives, picked the best ones, and by best I mean they're beautiful, they're functional, uh, meaning that they're easy to grow. They serve all kinds of, of uh, ecological functions in your garden, and you can have a beautiful garden at the same time. They're water conserving. Um, they're adapted to local gardens. So if somebody wants to get started or just refine what they already know about California native plants, first thing is to come up, visit, pick up a copy of this, and it's going to cost them what? Zero dollars. Ah, we it's like free. that. It's free. This is a... Uh, um, a project that the Botanic Garden did with the City of Santa Barbara, and the City of Santa Barbara has uh, published this and is making it available to everybody for free. Fabulous. Do you have, uh, if you were going to recommend to someone three plants to take home and give a shot in a typical Santa Barbara garden, oh, any boy. favorites? Well, um, I really love Matilla poppy. It's one of our our sort of iconic California plants. Great big, uh, we call it the fried egg plant. Oh, the big, the uh, big white. white flowers right. with yellow centers. Uh, our Howard McMinn uh, manzanita, which is a manzanita from Northern California. Very, oh, with the beautiful red bark. Yeah, very rare uh, plant in the wild, but does extremely well in cultivation. We'll take our little heavier soils and um, we tend to water our, our gardens more consistently than um, they get in nature. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, Ray Hartman Ceanothus. Ah. Yep. Wonderful plant. Sounds like a trifecta. Yeah. Cool. Myth number two, maybe. True or false? If we're using California native plants, we get to save a lot of water because we don't have to water them. No. Uh, well, it is a, it's a great um, myth to dispel because really, in fact, natives in gardens uh, do need water, especially to get established. So within the first, the first year is particularly important. And... Um, it's important how you water. Mm. So to get plants well established, you want to plant them in the fall because our rains are about to start right. and so that they don't have to uh, make it through their, their childhood, um, you know, in the hot, dry summer. They get some assistance with they natural get, rainfall, which is a better quality water anyway. Better quality, soils are cool, and you want to get those roots down deep. So you want to make sure when you water 
you water deeply. You give them plenty of water and make those roots chase that water down to where the water is stored naturally. One thing uh, we've, we've all, many of us have heard about is watering underneath oak trees. Oh. Uh, so putting high water need plants, people used to put begonias and ivy and stuff underneath our native oak our trees. beautiful native oak trees. No, you don't need and want to do that. There are lots of natives that, and we actually have lists of them, that are uh, adapted to growing in the shade and the root competition hmm. of oaks that don't need a lot of additional water. So you mentioned how, uh, it's important how you apply the water. Um, there's the belief that drip systems are the, the be-all and the end-all. People use micro sprays, people adapt their old lawn sprinklers. Ideally, uh, what are natives looking for? They're looking for water that is not just on the surface. The problem with micro sprays is that uh, at times you don't apply enough water because it, it, it's delivering the water slowly, which is terrific. But it means you got to water longer in order to get the volume. Yeah. So infrequent and deep, and probably for the first few months, making sure the root ball itself stays moist, but then yeah. having the roots chase the water right. down out into the right. soil. Right. You want to let that root ball even dry out. You don't want to keep it consistently moist. You want to water it, let it dry out, and then water it, and just keep getting those roots to chase. Great. Okay, another big concern people have uh, has to do with attracting the good guys to the gardens, oh, yeah. the, the pollinators, the butterflies, the beneficial insects that are going to munch up the bad guys. Um, right. How does that play out with California native plants? Well, it's, it, it, it's a match made in heaven. You know, who wants to surround themselves with herbicides and pesticides and live in that toxic world? We want to rid ourselves of that, and yet we want to have a beautiful garden best way to do that is to plant native plants, a diversity of native plants that are going to provide a balance. They're going to uh, attract insects to those plants. The insects attract birds. Um, a diversity of insects, they prey upon each other. So you get these little micro wasps that you don't even know are in your garden and they're feeding on all of the aphids. So it looks miraculously like it's taking care of itself. And in fact it is. Mm -hmm. And so you are doing a benefit to yourself by not surrounding yourself with poison and um, and you're promoting habitat for the things that are keeping us alive all the the many insects bees and birds and it's just a win-win so um, another myth is that if you're using California native plants that you're always trying to create what looks like a naturalistic garden, as if we were looking up at the foothills and nature did it. Everything's just sort of randomly scattered about. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's not the approach that you used here at the Pritzloff Conservation Center. So could you talk about how you use natives from a design point of view? That's a good question, because you know we've been, at the Botanic Garden, uh, most of the garden is in a naturalistic design. We are a historic county historic landmark, partly for our historic uh, natural design, but um, it isn't the only way that you can use native plants, and we wanted to make sure to demonstrate that when we built this new building. So we actually began with no plants in terms of how we planned the garden. We, t we planned the function of the garden. We needed something against the building. We have a stone bioswale. We have to shield uh, from our neighbors. So we picked the forms of the plants. We need something tall here and something low there. And we need them in masses of this size. Um, so we talked about what we wanted to accomplish. And then we put the plants into it. So what I'm hearing is form follows function. The, the, yes, the, yes. I'm, I'm the form it. comes later. Uh, the right. color of the foliage, etc. The first thing is that the plants have a job to do. Right. And is it safe to say that there's a California native plant that can serve any of those functions? Oh, yeah. If we wanted to screen a view or create an erosion control, right. those sort of functional. Right. And I will say that in design, um, flower color is the very last thing that you uh, take into consideration. Here, here. So I'm looking at a great example here of a high impact, um, high contrast garden where you've got the silver lace in the background mm -hmm. standing out against the building in this beautiful dark. So you know this. So I, I think this is just a beautiful example of what we're talking about here. Thank you. Yeah, it, it turned out great. And the interesting thing is that this stone planter here is, um, is here to grow the very rarest of the plants in California. These are two incredibly rare plants. 
but they're beautiful. So another myth um, that uh, native plants, California native plants are really Spartan. You basically dig a hole, you close your eyes, you drop it <laughs> in the ground, scoop the soil and walk away. That they, they don't need any special nurturing. They're, they're tough guys. Ooh, well, they're, they're adaptable. Some plants you can dig a hole and plop them in and let them go, but it's not really, you know, your best, uh, your best choice. The best choice is to know what your soil is. So, mm -hmm. Uh, and how do you find that out? Um, well, you dig a hole mm -hmm. and get a handful of soil, and if you can put it, uh, if you can clump it into something that doesn't get a little apart, bit wet first. A little bit wet, and if if you um, if you feel like you can throw a pot with it, then you're in trouble. Oh, oh, oh do ceramics, yes. right? Put so, it on a wheel. So that's going to be clay soil, and we have a, a lot of that around here. A lot of clay soil, and a lot of these uh, native plants actually don't like clay soil. So you have a couple things you can do. You can add organic matter, maybe a little sand, and you can mound them. Organic matter being compost, compost. or so it's the stuff you can buy in a bag at a nursery. Right, right. Um, and they will appreciate that. And the, the, the idea of them being Spartan is true. They're adapted. Um, they can survive in really tough environments, but, you know, they'll... They like the little cake and candy too, if you uh, um, if you give it a, the right doses. Okay, Betsy. So uh, I've come to the botanic garden. I've picked up waterwise native plants. Uh, I turn to page eight, and, I, and my heart stops because I'm looking <laughs> at this wonderful plant name, uh, Verbena delamina lilacina, uh, which sounds like a fairy princess's name. So <laughs> how do I get my hands on this? How do I put this in my car and safely drive it home and put it in my garden? Ah, that's a great question. Well, uh, one of the myths is that native plants are difficult to find. And I will say that um, here at the Botanic Garden, we have a retail nursery that's open to the public. And seven, that's year round, right? Seven days a week, um, 360 days. I think we're closed maybe five days a year. Um, and you can always buy native plants here at the Botanic Garden. We also have two... Um, month-long plant sales, one in the fall, which is when we recommend people get their plants and plant them, and then one again in the spring in April. So all of the month of October, all of the month of uh, April, we have uh, even more plants for sale. But there's always plants here, there's always expert advice, and um, there's always opportunities to get involved in growing and selling native plants here if you're interested in volunteering. Oh, wonderful. Betsy, thank you for your time and great information. We've dispelled some myths and uh, invite everybody to come up to the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden for the plant sales or just to uh, enjoy the scenery here. It's a fabulous place. You'll learn something while you're here. So what do you think? Getting a little excited about adding some natives to your garden? For more information about native plants and the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, visit sbbg.org. Experts say the key to success with natives is getting them off to a good start. And you're in luck because we caught up to my buddy Oscar Carmona at the Santa Barbara City College Lifescape Garden for some planting tips and techniques. Hi there, I'm Oscar Carmona, owner of Healing Grounds Nursery. I'm also an adjunct professor up here at City College and today we're at the Lifescape on the campus of Santa Barbara City College. I want to introduce uh, Louis Daniel, who is a um, caretaker here. He's one of the main main guys here at the Lifescape, a student, but also, but also manages this lovely property here. And today what we're going to do is we want to uh, demonstrate and talk about transplanting plants into the ground. And, and when we say plants, I mean that in the general term, it could be a bush, it could be a shrub. In this case, it's going to be a Eugenia tree which makes for a, a good a hedge. And actually that's what this is going to be, the first planting of what's going to be a demonstration hedge. So Lewis is going to demonstrate taking that plant out of the pot so that we can put it in this prepared hole that will accommodate the size of the pot so that we want to make sure that the pot is planted down into the hole but not below the level at which it's planted presently. So Lewis, why don't you go ahead and just put that in and oh yeah and we're going to Lewis is uh, opening up the the root area that's been confined by the pot so that it can start to grow you know outward as it extends and then as, as I said I think it's very important that you don't mound up into the the foliage you want to make sure that you're going to mound up to the level that the plants in he's taking care to make sure that it's upright as you can see too we've put water in here to, to create some moisture as a little dry before and once we plant 
the plant in. We're going to use some uh, organic amendments. Mostly what we're about is trying to find non-toxic ways of dealing with, with uh, plant health. So in this case, we're gonna use some uh, powdered kelp and uh, some liquid uh, uh, fish emulsion, which are basically multivitamin type uh, products. They're not gonna overly stimulate the plant, but help enable the plant to get settled in its new environment. I recommend about a quarter cup of fish, fish, a quarter cup of kelp to a five gallon bucket. And as I said, it's just a really good kind of a multivitamin to help the plant get acclimated to its new environment. And I've got here a little bit of soil amendment. It's just some soil building compost or conditioner. You can use compost, not mulch, but compost. You want broken down material so that the, the roots don't become part of that breaking down. So this stuff is pretty, it can be anything, compost, any kind of compost. A Eugenia doesn't require a lot of nutrition, just like uh, a lot of natives. Luce is also making sure that there's a little bit of a basin around the base of the, of the tree. That just allows the water to concentrate there right now. Eventually the roots are gonna extend out, you know, in all directions, but right now they're at the base. So that's where we wanna focus our watering. I think that one of the most important steps here is that you make sure you get enough water in there and uh, you wanna make sure that the soil is compacted around the roots so that you don't have any air gaps because that can create root rot. And that's one of the most important parts of transplanting is making sure that that tree is nice and snug, the roots. You wanna make sure that the tree is perfectly upright because it'll grow sideways if you, leave, if you plant it that way. And although it'll eventually grow upright, it's just uh, sort of defeats the purpose of a hedge. So we wanna make sure this is right. And now's the time to orient the plant how you want it. Uh, hopefully you'll see that this is a fairly easy process to undertake. And again, whether it's a shrub or a small plant or a tree like this, Eugenia, uh, the process is still the same. You really wanna make sure that the plant is well situated into the new environment, maybe add a little bit of comfort in the way of compost and some uh, light amendments, water it in well, and uh, let the sun and, and, and surrounding environment uh, nurture this plant to good health. I'm Oscar Carmona, wishing you happy gardening. Till the next time. So before you load up the car and take all your new little kidlings home, be sure to ask a staff member if there's any specific care that these plants need. You're watching Garden Wise. We'll be right back. mulch to my trees and plants. I put in a laundry to landscape gray water system to irrigate my fruit trees. I removed my lawn and planted water-wise native plants and installed drip irrigation. I stopped watering my lawn. Do your part by saving water in your garden. Get a free water checkup from your water provider. Keep saving water, Santa Barbara County. Hi and welcome back to Garden Wise. Aside from the hundreds of native plants we can use in your gardens, there are thousands more from climates just like ours around the globe. To help you sort through this mind-boggling array of plants, your water agency hosts a website that's free and fabulous. So fasten your seatbelts while I take you on a tour at waterwisesb.org. Hi, Billy Goodnick. I'm back and I want to share with you a really fantastic website that's brought to you by your local water agencies. I'm looking at waterwisesb.org. Don't go there just yet. Um, it's a fabulous resource and it only costs a million dollars to use it. No, it's free. That's the best thing about it. So I'm going to take you on a little tour of this uh, website. Once you get to waterwisesb.org, I want you to go down and uh, click on this little square that says find the perfect plant. Uh, and they're not kidding. 
take you through a little tour. That beautiful plant you're looking at here on the, on the uh, homepage is Fremontodendron. It's a California native growing beautifully up at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Uh, Fremontodendron, great plant, but that's not why we're here. Um, let's go through some of the features that are here that you can come back and explore later. Um, and we'll probably have some segments on future shows where we take you through in more detail. So under landscapes, you'll, you'll find tours and galleries. These are 24 different gardens that you can go peep over the fence, see what's going on there and learn about the plants there. Galleries is similar. Um, we've got a place where you can go and just look up plants you've heard the names of, either common names or botanical names, or it's got a search feature that's pretty good. I'm looking for a tree that only gets this big, that has uh, pinstripe polka dot leaves. Uh, you might find it here, you might not. Uh, great search engine. When you found those plants, you can create a list and there's things you can do with that list. You can print it out, take it to the nursery. You can categorize the plants based on water use. Great resource. And there's also a page here for a watering guide. Gives you a lot of information on how to water, how to program your controller, etc. But what we're here for today, under the resource tab, I'll click on that. Under resources, there's a lot of articles. Articles about irrigation, um, those pages I already spoke about, maintenance, etc. But today we're talking about design. How to get creative, how to create a garden that's going to serve your needs, be beautiful and easy to maintain. So I'm going to start with introduction to design. Seems like a good place to start. And there's some topics here that are just a good refresher, whether you have a good design sense or you feel like uh, you're stepping into some alien territory here, spend a little time at introduction to design. And it tells you about the planning process and how that leads through different stages till you're finally under construction. Talks about aesthetics, how to enhance the local watershed. We're trying to create gardens that uh, don't pollute our streams and our ocean. Good information here. Um, a little bit about the purpose of your garden. What do you want to do when you go outside? It's the first question I ask when I'm designing for someone. So all those ING words, relaxing, entertaining, growing food, playing with the kids, playing with the dog, all of that's contained in here and it's just food for thought. Uh -huh. Food for thought, got it? Okay, another place I really suggest that you stop is the questionnaire. I'm clicking on that, but it helps you understand what your preferences are, what's important to you, what might not be as important in your garden, uh, such as do you prefer softer muted colors? Are cutting flowers for arrangements important to you? Just some of the basic starting points. Also garden features that might help enhance your outdoor living. If you've got hot sunny places, do you need an arbor or pergola? Uh, are you interested in having a water feature that'll bring the sound uh, and movement of water to your garden? Sculpture, maybe there's something uh, you made at an adult education class that your spouse won't allow in the house? Put it out in the garden. Um, do we need gates, outdoor lighting, etc.? Very good idea to go through this um, and ask yourself a lot of these questions. Even down to furnishings, um, if you're going to entertain outdoors, how big a table? How many people are sitting down there? Great spot to spend a little bit of time. Um, principles of design, again, sort of, uh, sort of basics about unity, function, simplicity, scale. These are just general concepts that apply to any visual design, whether you're painting or uh, doing the interior of your house. There's a section on creating the design. So now we're getting down to a little more nitty gritty, uh, developing a color scheme that works for you. Great information about the color wheel, different types of color, warm color schemes versus cool color schemes, how to use gray and silver in the garden. Uh, hope you're not getting dizzy watching me scroll here. Uh, the idea of complementary colors, colors from opposite sides of the spectrum or adjacent, also called analogous color schemes where a lot of similar colors are in the garden. So good information here. Um, so we've gone, gone through some of the creative stuff. Now let's get into planting design. This is where the rubber meets the road. There are thousands of plants you'll find at the website. Um, I suggest you don't use all of them in your garden. That might be overkill. So uh, a nice article on planting design, emphasizing things like uh, foundation plantings, how close or far from the house uh, you put the plants. Definitely a no-no in high fire areas. We don't want to put fuel against the house. Other ideas, uh, how to, what size plants to use. 
And by that, I mean probably the, the greatest caution I give people is knowing the predictable mature size of a plant. If a plant's going to get 20 feet tall and 30 feet across, if you leave it alone, you don't put it in a narrow space and spend the rest of your life having to cut it back. So understanding how big a plant gets, very important in choosing its location. Uh, and this is all stuff you'll find at the planting tab that we're not going into today. So good information here. Spend some time on planting design. And just a couple of other highlights. There's information on installing the garden. Um, goes through the order of operations, what you do first, what you do next. Uh, of course, you're going to do any demolition plant material first. Then you might do any work that has to do with underground work, uh, drainage, irrigation lines, electrical. And then it leads through the different stages. One important thing is preserving topsoil. There's a lot of life in that. We don't want to stick it in the bottom of a low area or haul it off. Topsoil is brought out and then it's the icing on the cake that you plant into uh, later in the design. So uh, going through this might help you understand uh, how to dig the right size hole, what to put back in the hole along with the plant, what the first watering cycle is going to be like. Uh, last thing I want to touch on is working with professionals. You might be 100% do-it-yourselfer and you're going to take it from concept through final execution and maintenance. Along the way, you might need some help. So there's professional design groups out there. Uh, one of them that's highlighted at the website is the Green Gardens Group, G3. Very enlightened approach to not only water-wise design, but also how to manage water so it stays safely on your site, replenishes the uh, water table, and doesn't go out to the, to the uh, creeks in the ocean. Good information on professional uh, irrigation. The California Landscape Contractors Association has a certified water manager program. These are people who know how to design, install, program your clock, troubleshoot. Uh, very valuable. Even if you're doing your own garden, you might want to get some advice from these people. If you're interested in gray water, that's the water that we capture from our laundry system. Uh, and introduce back into the garden. We've got some information there and also I can't emphasize enough using licensed, bonded, insured contractors whenever you get into any kind of involved project. Sure there are things you can do yourself, there's things your gardeners can do, uh, but there's a point at which you want to have a responsible adult doing all the work in your garden. There's a whole lot more information at the website that we don't have time to cover here in the show, so be sure to schedule your own return visit to waterwisesb.org. You know, recent fires have had a tremendous impact on our community. We're going to speak with Andrew Raff, biologist for the Santa Barbara County Flood Control, and also landscape architect Kim True to learn more about how to keep our homes and gardens safe. As you can see here in Santa Barbara County, we live in a very beautiful environment. We're surrounded by natural resources, uh, the ocean obviously, creeks, trails, the national forest, grasslands. Um, it's also a very challenging environment. The topography is very steep and we have what's known as a flashy uh, rainfall pattern, meaning that rainfall uh, appears in a short burst followed by long periods of, of dry weather, typically. And that combination of factors can lead to a lot of runoff and erosion problems. Erosion typically is where soil moves, and um, it's usually caused by either wind or rain. Um, the majority of erosion that we think about locally happens whenever it rains. And if your soil is not protected and you have just bare soil on a slope, when water hits it, um, the force of the water pounding on the soil will actually start moving it. And if it rains hard enough and, and you start getting that weight concentrated of the soil, it can start sliding. The sediment that leaves the property upstream uh, is necessarily transported downstream. That's just how the gravity in the watershed works. It's always going to move its way downstream. But those sediments can also uh, carry contaminants with them. Street runoff has a lot of um, oil dripping, gas dripping, things like that from uh, basic everyday traffic. There might be other contaminants on the street runoff that gets carried into the waterways if the erosion is not controlled. I would encourage any property owner to take a step back from their property first and kind of look at how the whole uh, property is working. You know, the, the water and the gr and gravity are going to tell a story. So it might be helpful just to take a quick step back, look at your whole landscape, look at the roof, 
and then would work your way down from there. Think about where are your gutters draining to? And then once the water is off the roof and through the gutters, where is that landing on your landscape, your, uh, your impervious surfaces, your driveway, your patio, uh, things like that. And try to follow those pathways through your property, really from top to bottom. Some of the erosion uh, minimizing techniques that are used in this yard um, are ideas like small terraces. So trying to break up the slope a little bit and create flat areas so that the whole s slope isn't steep like this. You're sort of breaking it up a little bit. So if you get some momentum, it, f it slows down and then that helps with the water percolating into the ground and it reduces the likelihood that you'd have erosion. In this garden in particular, we have a number of native cultivars and a lot of the, the ground cover cultivars of the Ceanothus and some of the, the coyote bush that we have, some of the mountain lilac. Um, here we have some of the galvesia and some sages. They've all evolved on slopes and they have nice deep anchoring root systems that serve to hold the soil in place. Um, our lemonade berry, a lot of our plants you see along the cliffs on the beaches, those all have very strong networks of roots that can serve to hold the soil in place. So when you're thinking about erosion control on a slope, um, you know, you, you kind of want to stay away from anything that's very shallow rooted, but more of your semi woody shrubs or some of your ground covers that have woody components to them will have the same sort of structure underground, really anchoring and rooting the plant in place. We typically recommend uh, people to put three to four inches of mulch over any area of bare soil, simply because bare soil is the most likely uh, area to erode, uh, not only from rainfall or excess irrigation, but also due to wind. Mulch can help protect your soil during the rainy season because it reduces the actual impact of the rainfall hitting that bare soil. This is a type that's available locally, and I like this kind of, of a mulch because it has pieces of different sizes. You have some of these larger pieces, and then you have these shredded pieces. And what that does is it locks everything together and it creates a, a kind of a thicker blanket so things can't slide around. Another erosion control measure that's often used is an erosion control blanket. And as you can see here, this is actually a blanket product. It's made out of coconut fiber and, and hemp um, rope. So there's no plastic in this. A lot of erosion control blankets are made out of, um, will have some sort of, uh, the threading will be plastic. And I like to stay away from those because you leave these in place and, al and allow them to biodegrade in place. And you don't wanna have that plastic be introducing that into the environment. This type of a, of a product is used um, when you have a very steep slope, three to one, two to one, um, and you don't have any ground cover. So for example, where a site that was just graded, if you're doing some new construction and you have just bare soil everywhere, you'd wanna use a product like this on the ground first, and then you can actually put your plants, you can cut holes into this and put your plants right in it. The county offers quite a variety of resources for homeowners in the area, really whether you're in the foothills or if you're right downtown. There are three mul free mulch pickup locations throughout the county, one in Santa Maria, one in the San Inez Valley, and one in uh, Santa Barbara, where homeowners, uh, anyone really, doesn't need to be a homeowner, renters can do it too, property managers, um, can pick up mulch for free for their property. We also offer uh, free mulch deliveries. Depending on what municipality you're in, the county or the cities can guide uh, you to uh, what, look, what service would be able to, to deliver mulch for you. Um, that typically involves a large quantity, a half a truck or a full truck load, but we encourage people to buddy up with a neighbor or someone uh, in the area, uh, in their neighborhood, and you can split it. If you have concerns about erosion on your property and need help, visit waterwisesb.org slash professionals. Another important part of your water conservation strategy should be making sure that your irrigation system isn't part of the problem. Water conservation specialist Kathy Perret always has some great ideas on how to keep your irrigation system in tip-top shape. Hi, I'm Kathy Perret. I'm with the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation Department. Today we're going to look for leaks in a sprinkler system. One of the first steps to do before you turn the irrigation on is to do a walkabout. Try and look and see if there's any unusual, inefficient water issues that you might see. Brown spots, 
dead areas, super green areas, and moss. If we see in this corner over here, we actually have moss, which is indicative of too much water, poor drainage in this area, and it just shouldn't be here, especially during the warm months. Another thing to look for that happens fairly often is the seals around the top of the sprinklers, they're rubber and they'll leak. So you need to take a close look at just the top part of the sprinkler and see if there's water settling in or if you see it gurgling out from around the sides. It's an easy fix. Either replace the little rubber seal that's inside or if the water's leaking because it's at the bottom of a hill, they have little tiny rubber seals called check valves you can put in and that'll stop the water from draining out at the bottom of the hill. As we're going through and doing our site evaluation, you might want to have a piece of paper mark down where your valves are and then as you're going around and testing the valves, put down where each of the zones are. Right now we're going to check that backyard. I'm going to take a look at it. If I see any problems, I'll stick a flag next to it because it's always hard to find when you turn the sprinkler back off. This is always a good time to really look at your valves and make sure that they're not leaking anywhere around where the threaded areas are or where the solenoid is on the top of. So the sprinklers are on and they actually have pretty good coverage. The water's throwing from one head to the next head. But what I'm noticing is there's that misting happening. And the misting is water that's too much pressure coming through this and it's actually evaporating off and it's not making it to the surface. It's easy to address it by putting a pressure regulator on the system. Another thing to look for while you're looking for leaks is when the plant material has grown up over your sprinkler heads. What happens with that is that the sprinklers try and throw the water out, but it doesn't make it out here and you end up with a brown spot. I'm gonna mark this area and you can see the sprinkler is way down underneath here. So I'm going to mark this area so that I know to come back and make some adjustments, either move the sprinkler or move and prune that plant. Wow, we turned on the next section and, and this is what we found. I think we should turn it off. Can you turn it off, please? So as we check this one, what we can see is uh, the guts to the sprinkler are missing. Definitely going to be in need of repair. In fact, I think it's completely broken. We're going to actually have to replace this whole head. So it's good, once again, to mark where it's at and then come back out with a shovel, a flat bottom shovel. You're going to dig around it so that you can unscrew that sprinkler head, get a new one, screw it back on the riser, and then it should work fine. Let me give you all a close-up of what a sprinkler body looks like. Most times it's underground, so you don't know what the guts look like. Sprinklers are composed of a body that attaches to your main water. There's a little riser that screws into it. It's just a channel for the water. Inside of the body, there is the pop-up mechanism that's on a spring. This is called a check valve, just a little rubber washer that stops water from going back down the pipe. And then when it's all together, you just have a nozzle, and that's what directs the water where you want it in your landscape. This is something that everybody can do. And one of the very most obvious things to look for is green versus brown. If you look in an area that you know you have sprinklers in, and one section is nice and green, it looks like it has good coverage, and then you take a look and you see a section that doesn't appear to be getting even water coverage, First thing to look for is what's up with the sprinkler over there. You could have a broken pipe underground. You could have roots that have wrapped around and stopped the flow. It could be a failed sprinkler. On this one, what we've found is this particular sprinkler is not coming up at all. I'm gonna mark it with a flag so that I know when I come to do my repairs that I need to address this particular issue. When it's repaired, we should have an even coverage of water and everything should be healthy again. When you have two sprinkler heads on a zone that one is working and one isn't, a lot of times it could be a problem with the actual PVC pipe 
between those two sprinkler heads. What you need to do is to try and use a screwdriver or a soil probe and track down where it's the wettest. And unfortunately, you need to dig. Working in your irrigation system is wet work, it's muddy work, but you can learn to repair things like a PVC break by going on our website and watching a couple of the videos that we have for you. It can be done, it's inexpensive. Good luck, enjoy yourself, play in the sprinklers. To learn more about keeping your irrigation system humming, visit waterwisesb.org. Well, that does it for this episode. And remember, we're all part of creating positive change in our community and having a beautiful, sustainable, responsible landscape is part of the water saving puzzle. Visit waterwisesb.org for tips or to view past episodes. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can give us a call at 805-564 5311. I'm your host, Billy Goodnick, and remember, keep it water wise, Santa Barbara. <laughs>